Greetings. Welcome to worship at Madras United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Gigi Seekin, and thank you for joining me this Sunday. As uh, I'm recording this, it is the fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, we are getting very close to Christmas. I hope you will be able to join us on Christmas Eve, but uh, if you cannot come in person, please look for information about our Zoom um, online worship at 5 p.m. on December 24th. Uh, that's another great option for those of you who prefer to worship from home. Thank you. If you have an Advent wreath at home, I invite you to light your candles now. If not a wreath, then perhaps just a single candle. Uh, that's what I'm using here. I'm in the library at church and decided not to have a, an open flame, but I do have a candle that I want to light as we hear these words. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and our joy. O come, O come, Emmanuel. The scripture for today is from Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 55. Mary visits Elizabeth. Mary got up and hurried to the city in the Judean highlands. She entered Zacharias' home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. With a loud voice, she blurted out, God has blessed you above all women, and he has blessed the child you carry. Why do I have this honor, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Happy is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill the promises he made to her. And Mary promises, praises God. Mary said, With all my heart I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low status of his servant. Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored, because the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He shows mercy to everyone from one generation to the next who honors him as God. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel remembering his mercy, just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to Abraham's descendants forever. Friends, we are uh, wrapping up our Advent series, which we've called uh, There's a Song in the Air, named after the title of the song by Josiah Holland. So far, we have heard a number of songs from, from Scripture. We started with Psalm 25. Then we heard Zechariah's song, uh, which is also sometimes used in a morning prayer service. Last week, we heard songs from the prophets Zephaniah and Isaiah. And today, we encounter Mary's Magnificat, uh, named for the Latin uh, magnify, uh, because it begins, my soul magnifies the Lord. Uh, as I said, Zechariah's prayer is associated with morning prayer, and Mary's prayer, the Magnificat, is often part of evening prayer in uh, Western tradition. Even our United Methodist uh, Book of Worship makes reference to Mary's Magnificat in our service of evening prayer. Now, as Protestant Christians, I find that we don't really talk that much about Mary. Orthodox Christianity reveres Mary as Theotokos, uh, which is Greek for God-bearer, leading Mary to be called the Mother of God. Roman Catholicism also holds Mary in high esteem. If you receive the local Madras paper, you saw a photo this week of members of St. Patrick's Catholic Church 
hosting an Our Lady of Guadalupe procession where they walk from Culver to Madras behind a trailer with a large tapestry of Mary. In our Protestant Protestant concern that Mary not be idolized, I think we have perhaps made too little of Mary and have missed seeing a more complete picture of this woman who Elizabeth says is blessed above all women. Now, I think in a positive step, at le- uh, more recently, this has begun, begun to change. Scholars now talk about Mary as the first disciple and as a prophet. Blessed. It's the word I chose for my uh, sermon title, and it's the word that Elizabeth uses to describe Mary. I'd like to unpack it just a little bit. Blessed comes from a, another Greek word, uh, makarios, meaning favored or enviable or happy. And when you think about it, in some ways, it's a strange word to use to describe Mary. If we keep reading in Luke's gospel uh, through chapter 2, we'll get to the story of Simeon. And you may remember that Simeon uh, encounters Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the temple. And he uh, prophesies about Jesus. And then he tells Mary that a sword will pierce her own heart. Or her own soul, I think it says. Um, And John's gospel tells us that Mary is one of the women present at the foot of the cross when Jesus is crucified. Mary, as the mother of Jesus, will certainly suffer unimaginable grief. So why is Mary considered blessed? In today's scripture, our beatitude, and we can use that word, uh, it's much like a beatitude in the Sermon on the Mount, It says, Mary is blessed because she believed that God would fulfill the promises God made to her. I'm going to read it actually from our scripture. Um, Happy, our, our, our common English Bible translation uses the word happy instead of blessed. Happy is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill the promise he made to her. What were those promises? Um, And If we uh, go backwards a little bit in Luke's uh, gospel, there was the encounter with Gabriel uh, and, uh, and Mary. And Gabriel first says, the Lord is with you. So I take that as a promise that God is with Mary. And Gabriel goes on to say that Mary will give birth to a son, um, the son of the Most High. There will be no end to his kingdom. And Gabriel closes by saying, in answer to some of Mary's questions, that nothing is impossible for God. That's quite a lot of uh, content. That's a lot of promises right there in one very short conversation. And of course, not just that particular instance, that particular encounter, but I have to think that also in the back of Mary's mind is Um, would have been these promises that she would have grown up with, the covenant with Abraham, this idea that all the families of the earth will be blessed uh, because of Abraham and his descendants, as we read in Genesis 12, 3. Mary believes. She burst into song, uh, the song that we call the Magnificat. Mary praises God as holy, merciful, justice-seeking, and faithful to the promises made to Abraham and Abraham's descendants. Uh, For a bit of um, Bible history, if you will, Mary's song has much in common with the song of Hannah from nearly a thousand years earlier. You can read Hannah's song in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And it's from the time, if you remember very quickly Hannah's story, she had been unable to have a child. She was at the temple crying, and um, the the priest, Eli, asks her what's happening, and, it, and she explains. And, and then he tells her that, um, d- that she will have a child. She does, and when the child is old enough, she brings Samuel uh, back to the temple and dedicates Samuel to God. 
And in her song, she also says that her heart rejoices in the Lord. She talks about the reversal of the plight of the hungry and the well-fed. And uh, one of my favorite lines from Hannah's song is referring to God. He lifts the needy from the garbage heap. It's a, a pretty vivid image of God's salvation and God's saving grace. Now, Mary believed that these things were already taking place. God was already fulfilling God's promises. There is plenty of room for doubt and questions in our faith lives. Ironically, the virgin birth is one of the things that generates a lot of questions for people. And we don't always believe, or we don't all believe the same thing about this um, story of Christ and, and how Christ came into the world. I suspect at different times uh, within our own lives, we may believe differently. And our beliefs at 80 probably shouldn't look the same as our beliefs at age 20 or 30. And one of the things I've always appreciated about our Methodist tradition is um, that we try to make room for questions, doubts, and difference as we grow in faith. But my question for you is, today, what do you believe about God? What feels like bedrock to you? In the midst of inevitable questions and doubts, how is believing a blessing in your life? I hope you will sit with those questions this week. Uh, maybe an answer pops into your head immediately. That's great. Uh, sit with it a little longer this week. But if not, I, I would invite you to consider those questions. And as I was thinking about those questions, I realized that for me, uh, things that I consider kind of the bedrock of my belief have a lot in common with the things we hear in Mary's song today. I believe in God's goodness. I believe in God's love. I believe in God's concern for justice. And I believe God is with us which is certainly one of the main uh, take-home messages for this season. I hope you can compose your own list, and I hope that your belief is a blessing in your life right now. But if you are in a place this Advent where God's goodness is hard to see, whether you're worn down by two long pandemic years, personal grief, or impatience with widespread and persistent injustice, then I am especially glad that you are worshiping with us today. Because I think it's notable that Mary's song takes place during a visit with Elizabeth. And in her, in her time, Mary's journey of some 80 miles was not inconsequential. It, it doesn't sound to me like something that took place on a whim. I think it had a purpose. Perhaps Mary and Elizabeth needed each other in order to fully believe what God was doing. Just speculating there, we don't really know, but I do think it's, uh, it's important that our scripture records a visit between the two women. Friends, I think we need each other. We need each other when we are blessed by belief, and we especially need each other when songs of praise don't well up in our hearts. And I think we need Mary, whose encounter with an angel did not, um, did not blind her to injustice, but filled her heart with hope and joy and love and the expectation of God's peace. Amen. Friends, I'd like to close just a little bit differently than I normally do. I have a closing prayer today to share from the United Methodist Book of Worship. If you'll join me in an attitude of prayer. Holy God, 
the mystery of your eternal word took flesh among us in Jesus Christ. At the message of an angel, the Virgin Mary placed her life at the service of your will. Filled with the light of your spirit, she became the temple of your word. Strengthen us by the example of her humility, that we may always be ready to do your will and welcome into our lives, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, thanks again for joining me in worship. Go in peace.